Lieutenant Colonel Lincoln S. Ferris here with my trusty pipe hawk. Sorry, no falcon this time. When you're out there, outside the wire, people are gonna to come to you and accuse you of things. People are gonna present bad information, outright lies. How do you counter that? Well, we'll talk about it. Now remember, as always, these are my thoughts, my ideas, not use of KPOX, SWIC, anybody else's, just Colonel Farish's. Let's get started. Bias, lies, and misinformation. Dealing with in, uh, bad information and building individual legitimacy. What I'm going to talk about is information operations on the very, very small scale. How you can help the commander meet his intent through making sure that misinformation is mitigated by you uh, refuting it and you're, you being believed because you have individual legitimacy with the people you're talking with. Let me start with an example. There was an article I came across on Fox News written by an SEO, and it's important, remember that term, Jennifer Earl. She was the SEO editor for Fox News. And he talked about how one of the stars from Big Bang Theory, Kelly Coco, the uh, woman who played Penny, was keeping a prop. Now she told reporters during a winter press tour last year, she plans on keeping a poster of two robots wrestling. Now that was a press tour that was covered by People Magazine. Christina Dugan and Natalie Stone. It's something I love so much and I've looked at it for 12 years. Kuko said of the photo of two robots in a wrestling ring. So you got two robots in a wrestling ring reported on during a press tour covered by People Magazine that then became an article on Fox News. And here it is. This is the picture she was talking about, the, the poster. Two robots wrestling. Now, if you don't recognize it, those are the Rock'em Sock'em Robots, a toy popular in the 70s and 80s. You can still find it today. And notice there are two ropes on the wrestling ring. So the poster that they were referring to in the articles is a derivative of this famous painting by George Bellows back in 1924 of Dempsey and Firpo, a big boxing match they had where Firpo knocked Dempsey out of the ring. Bellows had been commissioned by the Saturday Evening Post, a huge, almost international magazine, to cover the fight. And this is the moment he did. So Firpo knocks Dempsey out of the ring. Fear, uh, Dempsey gets back, wins the fight. Huge, big, international news. This picture's been around a while. There are derivatives of it all over the place. You can see it occasionally in movies. The Simpsons did a derivative of it. But how did something as simple as looking at a picture escape everybody's attention? Well, remember, the person who covered this for Fox News is Jennifer Earle. She's an SEO editor, search line optimization editor. She's not a reporter. Accuracy is not the important criteria that she's being judged by. The number of clicks, the number of people that look at what she does, that's what she's judged by. And that's why we have a problem with misinformation, even more so than we did way back when. All right, so how did we get to this position? Well, journalistic practices, the objective, objectivity, neutrality, and balance were backlash from World War I. Because before then, it was a lot of propaganda, yellow journalists that journalists engaged to. Again, they were there to sell, not to inform in any real problem. Now, after World War I, and there were some enforced things during World War I on reporting that Woodrow Wilson engaged in, Probably not legal today, but again, historical note. So the print me or the media got together and they basically said, okay, we're gonna be objective and neutral and balanced. We're just gonna adjust the facts. And that always only occurred because you had local and national oligopolies that could choke out sensationalism. The problem then became media became the gatekeepers of what was all what was true and was not true. Some people even say the media's greatest power is what they choose to ignore. The greatest example of the media influencing what happened probably happened in February 27, 1968 by Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite was the media person. He was the most trusted name in news. There were only three 
television stations really, ABC, NBC, CBS. You might have PBS, and if you lived in a big city, you might have something more local. But for most of the country, when Walter Cronkite said it, that was the obvious and objective truth. Walter Cronkite went to go visit what was going on in Vietnam. He was there during the Tet Offensive, and he reported on it, saying that the war in Vietnam is lost. Who won and who lost in the Great Tet Offensive against the cities? I'm not sure. The Viet Cong did not win by a knockout, but neither did we. Seems now more certain than ever, the bloody experience in Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. What Walter Cronkite did, and he didn't say it was his opinion, but when he gave his opinion, it was treated as fact. He said the war in Vietnam was lost in 1968, that we needed to go back to the uh, diplomatic bargaining table and achieve a diplomatic solution to what was going on. An honorable peace, he said. The problem was, Walter Cronkite was a military guy. He didn't know what he was talking about. The Tet Offensive was led by the Viet Cong. They were reduced to almost nothing after Tet. All actions that the U.S. soldiers and the South Vietnamese had were force-on-force -force engagements with the North Vietnamese. The Viet Cong were gone. The Vietnam War was two parts. There was the insurgency led by the Viet Cong, and then there was the actual force-on-force -force led by North Vietnam. Actually, I should say North Vietnam were the proxies for China and Russia. But when Walter Cronkite said the war is lost, he legitimized the protesting that was going on. Because if Walter Cronkite said it, it must be true. He was that trusted. In fact, about a month later, LBJ, then president, went on national television and announced he was not going to run for re-election. Cronkite had mainstreamed anti-war sentiment and basically uh, reduced the ability of LBJ to run for a final term. Nixon came along and he said, we are going to get out of North Vietnam. That was his campaign promise. By 1972, we were out. By 1975, South Vietnam had fallen to the North Vietnamese and is now Vietnam. Back in 2018, the American Association for the Advancement of Science was warning about some of the problems we were having with online information. They did a big study called the Science of Fake News and the Spread of True and False News Online. So the next few slides incorporate that. Now, the great boon of the internet is you can get information all around the world. And the great problem with the internet is you can get information all around the world. And whether or not it's accurate, well, that's for you to find because there's no barriers to entry for the information. And it doesn't mean the information is accurate. And according to the paper, studies suggest the American sees three to 150 fake news stories a month. At one point, nine to 15% of Twitter users were bots. And there's 60 million, supposedly, Facebook accounts that are also bots. The interesting thing though, is even though people use bots to spread misinformation or just outright lies, it's people. It's the trust between people. When someone says something that you agree with, you're more likely to believe it, to question it uncritically. But that person has to build a little bit of rapport with you. Whereas a, an account that just spews information all the time, no, no actual person there. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the Lincoln for President movement. But there's no actual person associated with it. If I'm putting out Lincoln is the best, Lincoln is the best, a lot less likely. If on the other hand, someone comes out and goes, you know that Lincoln, he's really cool. And that person has said things or reported things that you agree with, you're a little more likely to say, you know what, maybe Lincoln is cool. So false rumors diffuse faster, further, deeper, and more broadly than truthful rumors. Top true rumors, thousand people. False rumors, a thousand to a hundred thousand. The truth take, took six times as long to reach a thousand people as it did false. Mark Twain said that a lie can be halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Or something similar to that. Now there's ignorance and there's propaganda. Now the DOD says any form of communication in support of national objectives designed to influence opinions, emotions, attitudes, or behavior of any group in order to benefit the sponsor, directly or indirectly. Now what we see in civil affairs is communication designed to influence 
the opinions, emotions, attitudes, behavior of a group to benefit the sponsor either directly or indirectly. Okay, not necessarily at the national level. Misinformation is just that, it's inaccurate. But propaganda is crafted. It's visceral. Focus, people focus primarily on the emotion and downplay the importance of other factors. It's desire over reason. It reinforces a belief or a stereotype. It's believable, at least at some level. It's at least partly truthful. Usually it outrages both sides. A lot of times titillation is involved. Information is mildly exciting with sexual undertone. All right, so here's some examples of propaganda you can find. The first one, destroy this mad brute, that's World War I. If you notice, the lady is scantily clad in the Kaiser helmet on top of the uh, bloodthirsty gorilla representing Germany. It's visceral, a little bit of titillation. You're seeing a half-naked woman there. Then you've got the Army, always mission ready, Navy, always disco ready. Now, while that's a bit more accurate than the first one, no, I'm teasing. So again, just playing on the stereotypes of the Army being better than the Navy. I'm sure for some reason the Navy thinks they're better than us, but you know, who cares? And then the middle one here, making fun of the North Koreans, you know, with this floppy disk, something you haven't seen probably in 20, 25 years. So again, making fun of the North Koreans and their inability to use technology. So again, all examples of propaganda, but remember, this is different from misinformation. This isn't a flight landed at 10 o'clock instead of 11 o'clock. This is, was deliberately created and crafted to influence people. Now here's another example. Got this from Forbes back in 2013. All right, and it said 1.6 billion rounds of ammo for Homeland Security. And again, Forbes is not a, a nothing, you know, weekly world news, bat boy has found his mother type thing. Forbes is fairly well recognized. So is this propaganda or just misinformation? Let's take a look. So the headline is sensationalistic, raises alarms, gets everybody to, to read the article, which wasn't really very good, but with a little bit of digging, you can find out what the real deal is. And the 1.6 billion rounds that DHS wanted was a request for quotes. The government said, how much would it cost if we bought 1.6 billion rounds? 1.6 being the upper limit. And this is a typical strategic sourcing contract. When you're buying a lot of stuff, you got to give people time to ramp up and you're trying to see if you can get the price to drop. So it was a five year IDIQ contract, indefinite duration, indefinite quantity, up to 1.6 billion. So they might buy 10 rounds, they might buy 1.59 billion rounds. And you might think 1.6 is a lot, but remember Chrysler won the uh, won the contract to supply the army during World War II with 45 caliber rounds. And in June of 1942 to April of 1944, they produced 3.2 billion rounds, just of 45 caliber ammunition. So Glencoe, which is run by DHS, is uses 15 million, years, 15 million rounds a year just in training. And DHS has 55,000 law enforcement personnel. That's like 402 rounds per person per month. Again, you're not conquering the world with 500 rounds per person. And DHS already qualifies quarterly with a 50 round table. So they already burn up 200 rounds a year just to stay qualified. So what the headline said and the article kind of got into, but you had to dig for, were two very, very different things. And again, Forbes is not Weekly World News or the National Enquirer. So why don't we fact check? Why do people just believe this stuff? Well, there's proportionality bias. Big events must have big causes. For 100 years after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, everyone thought there was a giant conspiracy and it kept changing things because no one wanted to believe that a actor walked into a booth that happened to have a broken lock while the guard just happened to be gone and Grant, who had been invited to attend the play beforehand, but decided not to go because his wife wasn't feeling well, that all of those that came together to allow Booth to assassinate Lincoln were somehow coincidences. People didn't believe it. They didn't want to believe it. There's the illusory pattern perception. 
a tendency to casual relations where there may not be anybody. Because, you know, if there's a reason something happened, that's a lot more comforting than chaos. Randomness is more threatening than having an enemy. Conspiracy theories feed the ego. Believers are special and unique because they possess secret knowledge. It's a way to deflect anxiety, you know? My life sucks, but you know why it sucks? Those people over there. There's pleasure in victimhood. It's not my fault. If you ever see Repo Man, you'll see this quote, the lights are growing dim. I know a life of crime has led me to this sorry fate, and yet I blame society. Society made me what I am. Selectivity exposure. People prefer information which confirms their pre-existing attitudes. That's why people who watch Fox News or Newsmax are different than the people who watch MSNBC. They self-select to hear the things they want to hear. There's confirmation bias. Information is more persuasive if it is consistent with what I already believe or expect. There's desirability bias. I'm not a loser. Those people are screwing me over. I'm the hero here. They're more likely to accept familiar information as true. And sometimes it's just authority rejection. I don't believe you, you work for the man. Now authority rejection goes to legitimacy. If a group doesn't see you, or another person who is uh, providing information is coming from legitimate authority. Your words, regardless of what you say, will be rejected. I don't trust you because you wear a three-piece suit and you work for the man, man. The punkers, the hippies started it, but the punkers really took this to a, an extreme. And you still find it today where people will refuse to listen. You can have all the facts. They don't want to hear it because it's coming from you. Now, in order to accept authority, the person has to accept that the authority figure is legitimate. All right? Obedience is an action directed by the authority. Conformity is social pressure, and compulsion is when you're obeying but only under duress. And you have to understand those three different things. Because if I pass on a lie, because I think it's true, my motivation is different than if I pass on a lie because someone told me they're gonna kill my family if I don't. And there's a huge difference between obedience and compulsion. And if you understand why people are doing it, maybe you can help get them away from that and bring them back towards helping out the, uh, the commander meet his intent. Now, again, we've talked about legitimacy, but here's another uh, take on it by Max Weber. So you have traditional legitimacy, social, cultural, appropriate, historical, that has yielded a just order, Pashtun Wali. We do this because it's tradition and history, and more importantly, it works. It may not seem logical outside of where we are, but for us, it works. For us, in this time, this place, it works. You have rational legal authority. It's a widespread acceptance of a particular system that rule of rules that everyone adheres to. Constitution of the United States. Driving laws. If you think about it, you're in a multi-ton vehicle going at speeds that will kill you. Driving on a road with you know some lines painted on it to show you where to be and where not to be. But because most everybody conforms to this, we don't have accidents or we don't have constant accidents. Then you have charismatic legitimacy. This is accepted because of an established or is governed by a revered leader. Okay, you can see this often with cults. Okay, now, legitimacy in a fragile state is difficult. So it's going to be founded on a consensus about a national identity. The population within a political boundary is deeply divided within itself on ethnic or class, religious or clan lines, or if the demands of the larger community are compelling to some portion of it, extremely difficult to develop legitimate authority. So imagine if every state had a different bank and didn't necessarily accept the money from one state to another. So you're in Mississippi, you get paid in Mississippi dollars, you go over to Georgia to buy something, 
And the bank's like, no, we don't accept that. Now you're stuck. Again, legitimacy can work small scale, it can work intermittently, or it can be super national. But people have to buy into it. You can compel them to a certain extent, but they're only going to do the exact minimum that they have to to avoid pain and or death. So when it comes to information, if it's given from a legitimate authority, it may be, it is more likely to be believed. But in a place where legitimacy is hard to find, a lot of competing interests for people's attention in discerning what is and is not true. That's why information operations exist. So legitimacy on the individual level is really derived from two parts, a relationship and an instrumental component. Relationships are just that. You have to start with building rapport, then you have to spend time with them. If you're visiting, say, the governor of the province once a month, you're not building a relationship. You're stopping in for a casual visit with someone you vaguely know. So you have to build that relationship. And that will take time and energy. Then there's the instrumental component. If I tell you the sky is blue and you agree, does that have any bearing on your ability to govern or to survive another day? And the answer is no. If on the other hand, I can help you because you're helping us, then there's an instrumental component to, to that. So if there's no relationship or there's no patronage, you're not legitimate. Just because they know you and they know you well, but you're not helping them out, you're not necessarily legitimate. Just because you're helping them out, but they're never sure what the hell you're gonna do next, does make you legitimate. So how do you build this individual legitimacy? I just said so. Consistency, proximity, patronage. How are you making the other person's life easier? I'm not just talking bribes, that, that's illegal, don't do that. But how are you bringing prestige or fame or security? Inclusiveness, you gotta be part of the group. You might disagree with them on everything they do. And if you hold yourself as an outsider, you're always gonna be an outsider. You've also gotta be equitable. You gotta be impartial. Now, all of these things take time and interactions. So you can't go see someone once a month or once a quarter. Even once a week might not be enough. And when you're there, you can't just sit down and say, hey, we're coming through in a convoy in 30 days, make sure it's not blown up and then leave. It doesn't work that way. Just like I said, with building rapport, You've got to cultivate these relationships so you can build individual legitimacy. So when someone comes to that person that you're talking to and says, the Americans went and killed all these people, and he looks at you, you say, no, that, that, that wasn't us. And they will believe you. So on the micro level, at the individual level where CA works, if you want to counter bad information, you've got to know the culture, which means you've got to read, probably should be able to speak at least some of the language. You've got to build individual legitimacy. You've got to avoid being seen as the other. It's going to require time and interactions with the audience, or at least with trusted members of the audience who can vouch for you. Hope you enjoyed that. Book recommendation, Savage Wars of Peace by Max Boot. Fun book. I mean, where else are you going to find out about which future U.S. president procured ladies of the night? Or how it was Nicaragua was kept stable by 100 Marines for about 13 years? Or how, if Woodrow Wilson had a little more patience, Russia would not have gone communist? As always, if you have any comments or disagreements, feel free to do so. Have some facts to back it up, of course. And email me directly or leave it in the comments below.